Thank you, Regent Beeson, President Kaler, Dean Zahir, distinguished faculty, alumni, and guests. And more importantly, congratulations to the Carlson class of 2013, your friends, family, and supporting cast. I am truly honored to, honored to be here with you today. And I realize everybody says that when they start a commencement address. But not many people can say that the University of Minnesota or the Carlson School played such an enormous role in their lives. Carlson is where I got my first real job. Carlson is where I received my education and made the friends that helped me start a company. And the U is where I met my wife, Denise, a fellow gopher. I have to admit, I'm a ringer. Not only did I go to Carlson twice, but the location for the graduation here at Mariucci Arena is the reason I ended up at the University of Minnesota. My dad and I are huge college hockey fans, and in growing up in Madison, you're going to clap for the huge college hockey fans, I'll take it. Growing up in Madison, there was nothing better than coming up to Minneapolis for the Gopher Badger Hockey Series. This was in the era of Bob Johnson and Herb Brooks, and for the younger folks in the crowd, those are legendary hockey coaches. It was a huge, huge deal as a kid. Even bigger deal was realizing that a Big Ten university could be in a city, not a college town, but a real city. A few years later, when I learned about tuition reciprocity, my mind was made up. And in fact, without being 100% truth truthful with my dad, uh, I never so much as applied to the University of Wisconsin. <laughs> Only to the U. So, so, sorry, Dad. <laughs> to make matters worse for my father, who's a proud owner of Badger hockey, basketball, and football season tickets, and even as my grandfather's Packer tickets, my younger sister Megan followed me to the U, getting both her undergrad and her master's degree from the School of Education and Human Development. And I guess, Dad, you should have had more than a couple of kids. <laughs> Mariucci continued to play a large role. I, had st I got student tickets as an undergrad. They were directly behind a post, so I could see just one end of the rink. I scored two of the ugliest goals imaginable at the old Mariucci as part of the Sigmanu intramural hockey team. And if you're sitting in section one, row 19, seats one and two, and I think somebody is, you're in my season tickets. <laughs> right down the road in Dinky Town was the setting for the most important day of my life. It was May of 1987. I was, my freshman year was just winding down, and I desperately wanted to stay in Minneapolis for the summer. But doing so meant finding a job near campus. And at the time, the only place you could find a job near campus is the want ads in the Minnesota Daily. So being the wildly selective guy that I was, read through the daily, I found a want ad with a giant dollar sign. Absolutely no description of the role, just a giant dollar sign. So of course, I ran off to the interview. I uh, and that didn't end up getting the job, and it was a truly horrible job. It was selling dry cleaning coupons door to door in the western suburbs. <laughs> so I didn't get the job, but I eventually got the girl. Denise is from White Bear Lake, as they say in the movie Fargo, go Bears. And thank God she desperately needed a job that day too. The huge dollar sign in the ad cast a spell on both of us. And it didn't hurt that my buddy Jason Nitsche read Denise's name upside down off her job application. Spring of 87 was big for me even beyond meeting Denise. That spring I met four people at Sigma Nu Fraternity right on University Avenue that played big roles in my business career. Many of you probably know Scott Lippman, very successful business person here in the Twin Cities, co-founder of the Minnesota Cup, which is associated with the Home Center and the Carlson School. But back in 87, Scott was just the older cool guy in the fraternity. He had an unbelievable car. It was a Saab. It was so cool, in fact, he would never let us move it in the parking lot. He also had a stock ticker in his room, and this is well before the age of the internet. I mean, he was happening. And Scott was already interested in business and already making investments, and he helped me to see that I could pursue a career in business. Uh, up to that point, it had never occurred to me. Three other people I met at Sigma Nu, Sean Ryan, Kurt Olson, and Dwayne Poole, became some of the earliest investors in Exact Target. These three guys quit their jobs, invested their money, and for two of them, even brought their own laptop to help us start the business. One of those guys, Dwayne Poole, he and I went to commencement together in 1991, undergrad commencement at, at Northrop. We sat right next to one another. 
And more than 20 years later, I stood right next to Dwayne, and we got a chance to ring the bell at the New York Stock Exchange. So I don't know if there's a lesson in there for all of you guys, but look to the person right next to you and be awfully nice. You may be dealing with them on a daily basis 25 years from now. 1987 was also the year I decided to apply to Carlson. And I wish I could say that it was hours of self-examination or deep insight that led me to business school. It wasn't. It was an 8 a.m. French class at Falwell Hall. The class was not going well. I'm sure it was a combination of my inability to learn language and the fact that it was 8 a.m. on a Friday. I was 18. Ask yourself what you're doing at 18. Well, ask yourself what you're doing this Friday or this Thursday night. Luckily for me, my roommate at Middlebrook Hall, Ken Griswold, was the one person on the planet that changed majors more often than I did. And after I returned from one of those awful French classes, I did what all college freshmen do. I paged through my roommate's mail. And in his mail, I found the, a Carlson brochure. And I recognized they had no language requirement. <laughs> so I decided to apply on the spot. After realizing that I, that I liked and I was actually OK at the pro Carlson prereqs of accounting and econ, I knew that I'd found my calling. So it's kind of funny to think that I selected a major, primarily because it didn't have a foreign language, and a couple decades later moved my family, family from Matamidi to London and ended up opening offices in Europe and Asia and Australia and South America. But it was through those travels and some experiences along the way that I found three, key, three key pieces of advice for building a successful career, and none of them involved learning French. First piece of advice, it's all about energy and enthusiasm. In the summer of 1990, before my second senior year at Carlson, and the dean has agreed that everybody gets a second senior year, I was lucky enough to land an internship at Steelcase. And as the dean mentioned, Steelcase is and was the largest manufacturer of office furniture in the world. The internship paid $10 an hour, 10 bucks. Thought I was rich. I got the internship through a series of interviews at the Carlson placement office. One of the interviews even involved my first business trip to Grand Rapids, Michigan. I was scared. It worked out all right, though. A few weeks later, I got a call from the Steelcase uh, HR rep saying, good news, Peter, we'd love to offer you an internship. I said, fantastic. Then he followed up and said, what city would, what sales office, what city would you like to live in? And I, of course, said, Minneapolis. And he said, okay, that's fine, but can you give me a backup city in case Minneapolis doesn't work out? And I said, sure, Atlanta. My mom lives in Atlanta. I can live with her. If not, this 10 bucks an hour is not going to go that far. The day before my last final, and five days before the internship was supposed to start, Steelcase HR rep calls back and says, Peter, good news bad, and bad news. Bad news, we have an intern in Minneapolis, and we have an intern in Atlanta. But the good news is there's this brand new regional manager in Cleveland, and he would love a summer intern. So I finished up my last final. I packed everything I owned that night into my Honda Accord, including a really sweet tape deck, because it's, it's still 1990. I drove all the way, to, drove to Cleveland, somehow found a found, furnished apartment, and on the first morning of my internship, that first Monday morning, I drove around downtown Cleveland with an actual physical map. I'm sure none of you have seen an actual physical map. <laughs> I was driving around Cleveland with the map, ready to cry, looking for an address. There was no Google Maps. You couldn't carry the internet around in your pants. I was looking for a physical address. It had never, no one ever told me the BP building is the one tall building in downtown Cleveland. My internship started. I got to do many glamorous, highly strategic business tasks, which I'm sure many of you will get a chance to do. I reorganized the fabric samples. On really good days, I got to deliver huge specification binders to architectural firms in Cleveland. And if I was really good, I got to go all the way to Akron and Canton, still with that folding map in my pocket. But that summer, I got the best and the most lasting piece of business advice in my career from that regional manager, Steve Morrow, who was new to Cleveland. Steve invested a ton of time in me and actually took me for beers, which was pretty novel. In one of our early conversations, Steve explained that as the new guy, as the intern, I was never going to know as much or have as much experience as everyone else in the room. Steve said, Your business, or my business career and life in general was going to be a lot like the first day of the internship. And he taught me that the one thing that you can control 
the one thing that you have control over at all time is your energy and your enthusiasm. No matter what happens, you and only you can decide how hard to try and to do it with a smile on your face. Throughout my career, I've applied what quickly became known as the energy and enthusiasm rule to tons of situations and countless hiring decisions. The, situa the, the, the decisions were not always a success and the hires were not always stellar. But in my experience, energy and enthusiasm tend to win the day. And I bet that some of you, after the ceremony and the ensuing celebration, are going to be packing up your car and heading to your version of Cleveland. Maybe some of you, literally. My suggestion to all of you, remember Steve Morrow, my regional manager, and remember the one thing you can control. My second piece of business advice for a successful career is ride the big waves. After heading back to Carlson for my second and final senior year, I get a job full-time at Steelcase. And after a few years of working in sales in Pittsburgh and West Virginia and beautiful upstate New York, I was promoted to a position that I truly coveted, field training consultant. In fact, it's interesting, the person that gave me that job, Rick Atherton, is actually here with me, one of the great managers at Steelcase. His daughter, Kelsey, is graduating today from Carlson. Kelsey, you're out there somewhere, aren't you? It's unbelievable. So Kelsey, the fact that you're graduating today makes me feel old. I can only imagine what your dad feels like right now. <laughs> From that training role, I was able to create materials for new product launches, and eventually I got an assignment that changed the direction of my career. I was added to a team that created the first CBT, computer-based training, at Steelcase. And I'm sure to all of you it's going to seem hopelessly dated to tell you that that training intervention was delivered on a CD-ROM. I should also tell you that I learned the term training intervention from Professor Womberg. And Connie, if you're here, thank you for making me sound smart at work and, and thank you for helping me get that assignment. But working with technology and specifically developing software opened up a whole new world for me. Compared to man manufacturing office furniture, the time from an idea to a product seemed like light speed. The conceptual nature of the work also appealed to my short attention span. Working on the CD was a giant wake-up call. If a project to produce software at an office, office furniture manufacturer could move that quickly, what would it be like working for a company that did nothing but build software? As much as I loved working for Steelcase, and as appreciative as I was for all the support that people there gave me, I wish someone would have explained to me when I graduated as an undergrad the importance of being close to growth in your business career. Working on that CD-ROM created an opportunity for me to see a huge wave emerging, one fueled by technology and a shift in how people would, would choose to take in information. When we started Exact Target, we were smart enough, or most people would say lucky enough, to see two huge waves in the economy and build a company around them. The first wave was software as a service, today called cloud computing. Delivering software via browser versus traditionally through a CD or DVD, created a huge amount of growth in the, in the business sector and huge numbers of opportunities. Salesforce.com is, is the first and probably the most famous example of a cloud computing company. And in 14 years, the same age as our son, uh, Salesforce.com has created $26 billion in market cap, countless opportunities for their, for their employees and in the ecosystem. The second wave that we rode when we started the business was the shift from offline to online marketing. Growth of the internet was really taking off, and mass media like billboards and, t and, and TV, the stuff of the Mad Men era, was on the decline. Personal communications directly to the, to the individual were growing. We built a company to help businesses manage that change, and today we're the largest peer play software as a service marketing firm in the world. I'm not suggesting that you build a software as a service company or one that looks at digital marketing. In fact, I prefer that you don't. We don't need the competition. But what I, am, what I would like to share with you today is what I wished I would have heard upon graduating. Look for companies, look for jobs, look for assignments within your current em em employers the same way that you would screen a stock. Look for huge shifts in the economy and run to those. Ride the big waves. My final piece of advice and challenge for each of you is the simplest. Start a company. 
Going to business school and never starting a company, it would be like going to dental school and never pulling a tooth. My father-in-law is here today, John Kenyon, 1958 graduate from the University of Minnesota Dental School. He not, and he started a very successful practice, so he got to both start a business and pull teeth. Can't beat that, John. By the way, there's never, there'll never be an optimal time. There'll never be a good time to start a business. There wasn't for me. I finished my MBA right after our son PJ was born in 1998 and right before our daughter Julia was born in 1999. And see, guys, I got both of your names in the speech, equal airtime. <laughs> and yes, our kids were born 16 months apart. And as I like to say, I, evidently, I was just that attractive for a very short period of time. <laughs> right after I got my MBA, I landed what I thought was my dream job at a venture capital firm that had specialized in investing in software and technology companies. The firm was based in Chicago. And while that software company, and actually ultimately the VC, failed, it allowed us an opportunity to start Exact Target. You're going to find there's a million great reasons to start a business. But when I thought about writing the speech, there was one that jumped off the page. Starting a business is the best way to land a job that you're not remotely qualified to achieve through an interview. <laughs> Who in their right mind was going to hire me to run product development at a software as a service firm with no engineering background. I was the guy in high school when my dad said I should take a typing class that said, Dad, what am I going to do with my life where I'm going to sit behind a keyboard? But not having a clue about software and software architecture was actually an advantage. Owning the business forced me to go out and create low fidelity PowerPoint prototypes and take those to customers and see if, they, if or how they would actually use the software. Becoming general manager at Exact Target Global and getting a chance to open offices all over the world is another example of a job you're only going to get by starting a company. Remember, I was the guy who picked Carlson because I didn't have to take French. I learned a ton in both roles. My palms sweat a lot, maybe not quite as much as they are right now. But I was able to deliver business results and amazing experiences that are forever shaped the way I look at the world. And by the way, this type of learning applies to any size business. You don't have to cash in your wife's 401k to start the business, although thanks, honey. You don't have to get venture capital backing, and you don't have to get, go public to have the same experiences. St starting any size business will do. Just the act of creating a business entity, thinking about a product or a service, and then actually going out there and selling it to a customer who pays you money is all it takes. Graduating today has huge advantages. Starting a business has never been cheaper or easier. The internet and cloud computing has democratized business. Google AdWords, Amazon Web Services, LinkedIn, Salesforce.com, Exact Target make the smallest startup look like and compete with the largest business. I have an opportunity now to live in New York and in a corporate development role with mergers and acquisitions, I have a chance to see startups every day. And I'm continually amazed at how much cheaper, faster, and easier it is to start a business today than it was all the way back in December of 2000. I encourage all of you to use the knowledge and the network that you've gained from this fantastic business school and start plotting your course to start a business. You'll learn a ton, and it's the single best way to continue your business education. Your graduation today marks the next phase in your business career. I'd encourage you to do three things. One, apply the energy and enthusiasm rule. Two, identify huge shifts in the economy and run to those big waves. And finally, at least one time in your career, start your own business. Congratulations to each of you for this incredible accomplishment, and congratulations to your friends and family members, remember to thank them, by the way, that have invested so much time to help you reach this milestone. My sincere wish for all of you is that your time at the University of Minnesota and the Carlson School of Management will have the same positive impact on your business career and on your life as it has on mine. Good luck. Go Gophers.